Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to Faith Seeking Understanding and one of our shows here that we produce, uh, Courageous Conversations, where we have a conversation about some controversial matter that is important to the church. And uh, so uh, I am Alan Bevere, your host. I am a pastor, retired uh, professor, uh, a Bible moth, a theologian in exile and a peddler of hope. And I am the self-appointed Anselm of Canterbury Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture here at Faith Seeking Understanding University, a completely made up university, but where we invite all persons to come and ponder profound things free of charge. And I'm very pleased this morning to have conversation with two two friends of mine, um, Joy Moore, And Joy is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and is the professor of biblical preaching at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, And as I understand from our conversation beforehand, colder than Ohio, where I am. And she is also uh, a podcaster. She podcasts on the um, Sermon Brainwave is the name of the show. And you basically... Uh, it's a, it, it discusses the lectionary for Sunday, for Sunday, correct? Those who are preaching um, the lectionary, uh, it's a weekly podcast that goes through all of the texts. Wow. Okay. For well, what- well, in fact, I'm going to actually re- I recommend that to my, my lectionary group that gets together. So uh, by the way, friends, we'll put all their in- this information in the descriptions on both the podcast and video cast and links. So you'll be able to get get to that. And you, um, you also have, I love to tell the story. And I love to tell the story is uh, also uh, uh, a uh, podcast uh, for preachers uh, and those who are looking to um, understand uh, the biblical narrative. So looking at the larger stories that um, some uh, are not included in the the, uh, lectionary, uh, and in the Revised Common Lectionary, and uh, others are just those familiar stories that we've forgotten um, that actually set the context for mm. uh, the rest of the text. So uh, it's called I Love to Tear, Tell the Story. It's based on the Narrative Lectionary, and uh, it also is a weekly podcast that I do with my colleagues here at Luther Seminary. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we'll put all that up. And my other uh, uh, conversation partner is is, uh, Michael Gorman, and Michael is the Raymond E. Brown Professor of Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Maryland, and Michael and I have known each other for many, many years, Um, and he is the author of uh, many different books and has written, he's one of my go-to people on, on the Apostle Paul. And uh, his, his works are very helpful and informative. Michael, you've got a new book coming out in about a month or so, correct? Right. And its title will be? Uh, what is the title? Um, the Self, the Lord, and the Other, According to Paul and Epictetus. So it's a rather technical work. It's a rather technical work, yeah. You know, I, I listened to an interview, a podcast interview you had a little bit ago. I don't, I don't know when you did it, but it was a few weeks ago. But you have written, you know, his, your book, Becoming the Gospel, which is a wonderful book. But you've, you've written two or three books on Paul. And if I, if I hear you correct, if I heard you correctly, in some ways, those books are meant to go together. Did I hear that right? Yes, there's, there, of the, th- well, yeah, there's three books that work together. The first book called Cruciformity, then a book called Inhabiting the Cruciform God, and then Becoming the Gospel. The three work as a kind of, I, I call them an accidental trilogy, but yeah, they do work, they do work together, okay. hopefully. Okay, good. All right. All right. Well, that sounds good. Well, I appreciate the work both of you do in, in this area. So our conversation today, uh, our courageous conversation is about abortion. Um, a very, an, an issue which, at least in my view, in our culture, usually generates more heat than light. And so what I'm hoping is going to happen today is that we're going to have a better conversation uh, about abortion uh, and uh, try to go beyond the talking points and, and those kinds of issues, uh, the kinds of things that come up uh, regularly. So the first question I want to ask is, uh, because I've invited both of you to be here and you, you graciously consented, 
what brings you to this conversation? I'm going to go last on that, but Joy, I'm going to ask you, what brings you to this conversation about abortion? Well, I could cheat and say uh, you invited me, <laughs> for which I'm very grateful. I am grateful to be a part of this conversation. Appreciate your uh, leading us uh, in these uh, conversations uh, on faith seeking understanding. And uh, I'm grateful for your work, uh, Michael. Uh, so it's a privilege for me to, to share this conversation with you. Um, uh, but uh, on this, this topic in particular, it has become a... Um, for, for quite some time now, it has become a conversation that is incredibly divisive. And uh, so we, we use terms that like uh, pro-life um, and uh, it becomes more of a political stance. And we, um, I'm gonna get in trouble today, I am for sure, but we do, do things in the midst of this conversation that uh, in some ways rewrites our um, religious convictions uh, mm -hmm. around a political position. And uh, it seems to be um, a, um, a difficult conversation the, the more it is politicized. And uh, I, it's, it's a difficult conversation as, as our conversation will, will illuminate, but it is becoming increasingly so uh, as it has become more politicized. Yeah. So um, my desire to be in this conversation is um, to ask some tough questions. Um, so maybe not say a lot of answers, but to ask some tough questions for Christians to ask ourselves um, when we find ourselves at, the, at a table that is having this conversation. Yeah. Tough questions. Well, we are not, we, are, we do not avoid those here. So, um, you know, ask away. And, and I, I also know you'll have some great insights to offer us as well. All right. Thank you for that, Joy. Michael, what brings you here? Well, first of all, I want to express um, gratitude to you, Alan, and to Joy for inviting me to be in this conversation, and to Joy for just articulating something I, I feel as well. But for myself, this is a conversation that goes back a very long way. I think it was generated by a personal experience of someone I knew in high school who, um, or right after high school, actually, who uh, had an abortion as a teenager right after the uh, Roe v. Wade decision came down in 73. So the opportunity that had not presented itself before that for, for teenagers and for other young women was there. As a result of that, um, when I was taking my first uh, semester of, of seminary studies, I was reading in an early church history class I was reading um, the church fathers and was surprised to see the word abortion mentioned in some of the early Christian writings. And I became fascinated with that topic, both personally and, and uh, academically, and ended up writing uh, a long research paper that turned into a short book on, on, uh, on the subject called Abortion on the Early Church, which came out, I'm almost embarrassed to say, 40 plus years ago. Uh, I'm grateful for that book, Michael. Oh, uh, thank you, Joy and, and Alan. Uh, there's a long story that, that comes after that, but uh, I think the takeaway for me in that research was not simply that the early church had a position, uh, which can be summarized pretty briefly, but, but that its position was holistic. Uh, it, it was not the political position that you were just describing, Joy, nor was it the narrow-minded what I would call narrow-minded position of some people who self-identify as pro-life and are, are, are pretty narrowly concerned and so forth. So anyhow, that's how that, that all generated, but uh, it's something I've written on, talked about off and on, often sometimes more on than off over the last 40 plus years. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I've come to this conversation because it was, uh, Growing up in the household I grew up, that was like, you know, in what I would call an evangelical household, that was like one of the flashpoint positions, you know, abortion was front and center. And so it was always there. Um, and, and, uh, but I, I think, I think in, in my, uh, oh, oh, as time went on in my education and looking into issues, um, I began to see that, uh, that, uh, 
I became concerned that we Christians, and by the way, it's not just, it's not just Christians who consider themselves pro-life who do this, but, but a lot of us, we, we have one or two issues through which everything is refracted. Joy, I think maybe you're hinting at that uh, in some of the things you, you just said. And that is, is that, you know, the question for me became, what did it mean to be pro-life? Um, that it was maybe a little too narrow, Mike, Michael, as you, you know, it, it, pro-life included the issue of abortion, but that wasn't the only issue. Uh, what does it mean to affirm life? Uh, be, be, uh, be con- you know, Shane Claiborne talks about a consistent life ethic from womb to tomb. And Michael, every time Shane says that, I say to myself, oh my gosh, I said, we were using that language before Shane was born, right? Right. And, and our, our friend, the late Ron Sider, talked about that, uh, a consistent life ethic from womb to tomb. And so- well, Alan, I need to interrupt and tell people what that's referring to. Alan, yes. Alan when he was still a- Still, what a senior in college. As a college student, yeah. Organized a conference at his college, Malone College, to address these issues broadly. You know, womb to tomb kind of consistent ethic of life, and and he asked me to be uh, one of the speakers with Ron Sider, and uh, it was a great conference, I thought. And you did yeah, it, a job, especially as a college student. It went it, it it went well, and I was really pleased because I I would I got into some trouble in organizing it. So <laughs> so after it was over, I thought, well, that was worth my that was worth worth my grief. So uh, <laughs> it worked out really well. So so the, the issue for me is because I believe, and I'm I'm sure you would uh, concur with this, that Christians are life affirming people. But what does that mean in a larger context? Abortion included, but something larger. And, and, and that's where, how I come to this conversation. All right. So let me begin, first of all, before we get directly into abortion, which we will, I wanted to talk about um, Roger Olson. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with Roger Olson's work, but he, he writes, he's a, he's a great theologian and historical theologian, and he writes a blog. And he wrote a post about a year ago, I want to say, uh, on the state of Christian ethics, Christian ethics in America, and he's not real, he's not real affirming of, in fact, he pretty much thinks Christian, um, Christian discourse in the American church is in an abysmal state, and I have thought that for a long, long time, uh, and I don't blame the people sitting in the pews for that. I actually blame those of us who are clergy, <laughs> not leading people in these conversations in a good way, um, and you know, that, that is, you know, my frustration has always been is that Christians in America, regardless of what the issue is, we resort to what I'm going to call the more secular language or the more uh, cultural language, forget the word secular, the more cultural language uh, that's already out there in the air. When we Christians have a wonderful uh, theological well of resources by which to think about these issues, which we just don't tap. Um, and, you know, we resort to rights language. I, I personally am not, I'm not a big fan of rights language. I know it's there and exists. We have to encounter it. But I just think there is so, I, I just, for example, I don't think with abortion, uh, uh, the right to life and right to choose is just not a helpful conversation. And I think it's actually uh, it, it, it helps keep the conversation from being had. So from, from each of you, I, I mean, I'll start with you on this one, Michael. What, what did, where do you think the church fails to draw or how, why does the church fail to draw on the deep theological resources we have uh, that, by the way, in America are readily available? Why do we fail to do that? Yeah. Well, I, it's an interesting question. I, it's sort of the, the question of accommodation, and that's not just a question of Christian ethics, but of Christian life in, in general, and it goes way back. I'm, I just finished teaching a course on 1 Corinthians, and it seems like the, the, the topic of uh, accommodation to culture is just part mm-hmm. of the, the fabric of Christian existence, and, and challenging that from generation to generation is is always problematic and always a challenge for us as as leaders in the church 
Um, I'm not clergy, I'm lay Methodist, so, um, but I, I see my role as, as try, part of my role as a, as a theologian, as a biblical theologian, is to tap into those resources you were alluding to. So for instance, on this very topic, instead of the language of rights versus rights, what if we started with really basic theological language like creation, covenant, um, incarnation, call. sorry? Call. Call, love, uh, neighbor love. What, what, you know, these are the kinds of um, sorts of frameworks that help us to understand and articulate a, a Christian viewpoint on these issues. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree, but perhaps if we start to use similar language, we'll move in a, in a better direction. That's, that's my offer about that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, Joy, uh, you're nodding your head in affirmation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and, and Michael, you've set me up uh, very well. Um, uh, I teach preaching. And uh, I teach it uh, out of this idea of how do we as leaders, um, uh, this goes back to what you were saying, Alan, how do we as leaders um, help people to learn to speak the language we call Christian? Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't know how to speak as Christians. We fail to be a peculiar people to use uh, uh, that that language from scripture, or as uh, Will Willimon and Stanley Harwas wrote uh, in a very old book now, uh, Resident Aliens. Um, we've we've um, accommodated culture in so many ways, and uh, our language has become the kind of stylized speech that is filled with hashtags and and easy uh, words that have a, a wealth of meaning in our particular a community, but doesn't uh, challenge the imagination to say, what's the peculiarly Christian wisdom perspective of that language? Of, uh, and it would be a different language. So I really appreciate, Michael, you, you calling us back to creation and covenant. And uh, what does it look like for the God of life to take on human flesh? And in Jesus, we see this uh, uh, just abundance of neighborly love uh, to try and pull together uh, the terms that you use. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, um, I, I think of uh, the overarching uh, story of scripture is one of life. Mm -hmm. And the overarching story of at least uh, American uh, culture is, it, it seems to be framed around right, uh, rights. And so we no longer talk about what is responsible when we talk about what is do me. Mm -hmm. And the more that we become centered around ourself, the less that we are attentive to what will form a community that is life-giving for all. Mm. That's very well said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sounds like it sounds like one of the tasks of the preacher, Joy, is to invite the listeners into a new world that uh, they could not have imagined on their own. Exactly. Wow. And that's why we follow a revelation that has been handed to us in Scripture, the canon of Scripture. Yeah. Because it's not something we would simply observe. Yeah. And, wow. and so our job is to rehearse um, and, and that recital of a peculiar community forms a peculiar community, but it's challenging because everybody just wants to fit in. And, you know, we're still tempted by the, the very same uh, temptation that um, uh, the serpent gave to uh, uh, the first couple. And that is, you know, you want to be like God. Well, how much more like God can we be than a divine transcript? You know, we we were the very icons uh, of God, and yet we 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 fell for that temptation, and we're doing that over and over again, depending on what the culture puts before us as the litmus test for what would be right. Yeah, and that leads us to questions of rights. 
And since we get so unmoored from this theological language, this, this, this vocabulary, uh, this Christian vocabulary, we, we don't understand that, for example, the right to life it just isn't true. Because when you read the Bible, I mean, life is a gift, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you and I are not here because God owed us something. No, no. And, and, and life is a gift. So right to life makes no sense if, if you're talking from a Christian perspective. But also, you know, the right to choose, I, I, when I hear that, I always say, I, I don't know why that's a significant point. Because we all choose. I mean, it just is kind of a given that we make choices. And it just seems to me that once again, it goes back to what you were just saying, that it, it's a question of, of what is owed me right? I mean, in other words, I just don't, when I hear that, I just don't think that's a significant point. Um, and, and, I, and I find, I just find the conversation currently in reference to abortion from a Christian perspective, just very dissatisfying um, response. Two, two thoughts of, about that. Um, one is, I, I agree with you that uh, the conversation isn't very helpful when we when we frame it completely in the in the uh, language of rights. But that's very American way to do things, cool. and it the the problem I think is that uh, the right to choose not only about that subject but more broadly has become almost an idol. I would say more than almost an idol in our culture, so that. Uh, on the day that, I think I've got this right, on the day that the Roe v. Wade decision came down a year ago, or, you know, the overturning of it, there was also an, a loosening of certain gun restrictions by the Supreme Court uh, in the same same week. So this American idol, <laughs> I-D-O-L, of abortion rights and gun rights, people see them as opposite ends of the spectrum. I think just the opposite. I think they're the same they come out of the same lack of imagination to go back to that language of imagination that, that leads people into um, a very self-centered way of thinking about their lives and, 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 and life together. Yeah, I think Al Alistair McIntyre referred to it years ago as the tyranny of the individual. Um, you know, we become our own tyrants. And, and the purpose of uh, the purpose of the state is to allow us to be our own tyrants uh, and, uh, and do what do what we think is good for us, whether it is or not. It's a good point. Joy, thoughts on that? Yeah, throughout scripture, uh, the right to choose has uh, repeatedly um, uh, been um, uh, rehearsed as our choosing poorly. Um, so if, if you think about uh, the uh, first establishment in Israel of a king where uh, Again, the choice was, we don't want to be led by God. We want to be led like everybody else. And in that refusal, uh, that intentional uh, refusal of being a peculiar nation, um, Israel chose to be like everybody else. And the warning that was given was that this is going to enslave you. Um, your very choice, what you are desiring is going to enslave you. And, and I thought of that uh, when you use the word tyrant, um, because that tyranny um, is, is, is what it means to be locked into something. Uh, and, and the other thing that, that, uh, that comes to mind when, when we talk about, uh, you, you talked about, uh, I, I would say the same coin, different sides. Um, we use the language pro-life, but when we use that language and uh, we're not attending to the choice that is being made in the broader conversation. So when I have this conversation with my students or when I'm, when I'm doing um, workshops, I'll often put capital punishment against abortion. And usually uh, there's a high percentage of people who are against abortion and for capital punishment. And on the other side, those who are for abortion and against capital punishment. And, and that's, that's a broad statement, but the statistics are, are, are there. 
And when you begin to explore, well, what is it that the people who are against capital punishment are desiring? Where they're desiring comfort, they're des desiring uh, to preserve their way of life, uh, they're desiring to have um, what they believe is safety and uh, prosperity um, uh, available to them. So they do not want um, that kind of intrusion on their life of a criminal. Yeah. Well, I can use those very same words for why a person would choose an abortion. They are looking for a security in their life, which the timing of this intrusion, I, I, that's harsh language, but the timing of this intrusion is going to compromise. They are trying to find a certain level of stability, which this is not, which this is going to eliminate. And, and so you can use the same language of choice with those two issues. And suddenly we realize the idea we were talking about earlier of womb to tomb has been completely ignored because we, we talk about, uh, and this, this, this particularly affects um, um, more impoverished communities, which Michael, your book on the early church and abortion recognizes that uh, the practice of abortion was the gift of the privileged. And uh, until recently, um, in more uh, impoverished communities, abortion was either too dangerous or just not uh, ethically within the imagination. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now, on a political scale, the imagination has been shifted to, um, if I particularly talk about in the Black community, uh, Gallup poll in 2020 um, identified that as the African American community um, became more identified politically with the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party shifted uh, toward abortion, the Black community shifted toward abortion. Hmm. And it, it, it's a parallel that we don't look at that is politically um, uh, identifiable. So the question of uh, in the African-American community, well, for a long time, we didn't have the right to decide um, for life for ourselves. And if you, I, again, this is gonna be a dangerous point, but if you look at the history of the uh, attitudes of those who were uh, originally interested in women's abortion rights, they were also very much against the thriving of the African-American community. And abortion was a way of eliminating the African-American population. And that we don't, we don't wanna talk about that. And so that, that's a problem for me because today I'm looking at the demise of the family in the African-American community and the loss of, of the capacity to raise a child in an environment that our culture says is an unrealistic environment. Mm -hmm. A father, a mother, commonly sire children. Why is that unrealistic? Mm -hmm. Wow. Joy, you uh, reminded me, <clears throat> I can, this just dates me a bit, but I can remember two, two things that will surprise some of our listeners. I remember Jesse Jackson, in his early days, speaking out ex exactly for the reasons you were just talking about, speaking out against abortion. I, I believe he changed his tune after a while, but I can still remember some early quotations from him. And then also, I was a member for quite some time of uh, a group called Democrats for Life. Uh, there was a significant contingent of pro self-identified pro-life Democrats in the 70s, 80s, and maybe even into the 90s, that group has, I don't know if the group still exists, but but the, the entity as a, as a body of people 
is that that's almost oxymoronic today. What pro-life Democrat? That you know that that can't possibly exist. Um, so I, I I think that there's different perspectives from in di different subcultures within the country, but there's a general there has been a general trend for this bifurcation that you were talking about that we've all been talking about. Uh, if you're Democrat or if you're so-called progressive or liberal, you have to have this position on these issues. And if you're a conservative or a Republican or whatever language you want to use, you must therefore have this position. It all, it boils down to politics and the church. Where's the church in all this? Where's the, peculiar, yeah, where's the peculiar body of Christ? What are we going to do about about living out the gospel with respect to this instead of playing politics in Washington or in Albany or Denver or wherever it happens to be. So let's talk just a little bit because I do want to move into the question of how we might as Christians reframe this conversation on abortion. But we have we have done some critiquing here of quote unquote the pro-choice position and I, I I take it the three of us would not necessarily embrace that terminology for ourselves but the pro-life movement I mean I mean I've I've had my problems I mean I I, I have to say I am you know I'm, I'm not I don't consider myself pro-choice on abortion um, um, I think some I think some of the extreme positions uh, on, on the Republican side are a little problematic and we'll talk about that but you know the pro-life movement is again as uh, we talked about something larger i mean i i don't think I, I think here's here's my thoughts and and then i'll let you have you respond i think we've gotten some some of these folks have gotten so uh, focused on the notion that life begins at conception which may and i i've always said if life doesn't begin at conception i don't know when it begins but um they're so focused on that that they can't see the larger issues involved that help them think about what does it mean to be pro-life consistently and across the board. So, so I think the criticism that some on the left have given to a lot of pro-lifers that they're really not pro-life, they're pro-birth. I think that's a fair criticism. I think that's a fair criticism. Joy, what do you think? Absolutely. It is definitely. Uh, and, uh, it has, it, in that sense, it's become a, a, a um, political litmus test of which on the left, on the progressive side, um, you can't be for this. If, if it's a political divide, and this is the position that my uh, opposite is taking, then I have to just take the other side uncritically. And, and so I think that's where the, the political divide uh, begins uh, to be evident. But my question becomes, what happens when that child is born? So um, both of you talked a little bit about being back in college. And um, when I was in college, um, one of my friends uh, found out that um, she was pregnant. And uh, the circumstances of that pregnancy was that um, it, it, it's complicated in the sense that uh, she was a person who identified as white, who had been um, dating a uh, African-American young man in a small town uh, in Southern Illinois, and uh, he had been killed. And after she found out that he had, he had died, I think in a maybe a, a, um, automot automobile or, or, or a, uh, maybe a motorcycle accident, after she found out about his death, she also found out that she was pregnant, or at least she thought she was. And so she asked me if I would go with her up the street from our college to uh, the hospital, to the clinic, uh, to, be, to get a pregnancy test. And without hesitation, I went. At that time, I was very clear that I was against abortion. Now, um, self-serving, um, uh, self I happen to be adopted and I'm very grateful to be of my age because I'm sure if I had been born uh, a few years later with abortion rights, um, I would have been aborted. I don't know that. We know nothing about my birth parents, but I'm very grateful for the adoption option in that sense. But in her moment, she needed someone to walk with her. And as I walked with her, I was making a decision that was 
I'm going to be with her if she is pregnant and decides to keep this child. I'm also going to be with her if she decides to abort it because I'm her friend. And whatever decision she makes, it's going to be a difficult decision. And I, I, I want to walk with her through that. Now, if she had asked my opinion, I would have said, hey, look, we, we need to pray for there to be the right family. But here's the problem with that. Putting the onus on the adoption option basically denies a typical family um, the, the way every culture and every generation understood it to be, a father and mother and commonly sired children. And so we are perpetuating um, this brokenness of family by offering this chain of supply of children that most of the people who are pro-life would not themselves adopt. And if they would, they would not adopt them as their own flesh and blood. The irony of that, that comment. If you'll allow me to explain that, that mm -hmm. statement. I know, of, uh, I, 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 I know of someone who uh, is an Anglo parent and um, they have adopted a black child, and in this case, I, I have to say uh, the 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 gender of the person as well. The father was excited the day his teenage African American adopted daughter came home, and these were his words to me, uh, to me in the group that we were in. He was pleased because she had finally realized. He was the enemy. Take in what, what, what I just said. This white man who had raised this child was so identifying in his whiteness and her blackness that he was, and his maleness and her femaleness, that he was grateful that she saw him as the enemy. Hmm. Now, I had the privilege of being uh, uh, adopted. Uh, by uh, parents of the same uh, race. Um, I hate those terms, which is why I'm stumbling over myself. Uh, that would be another conversation I'd love to have with you, but, but let me get back to this. Um, my parents were, were of the same race as I, and my parents raised me as theirs. And there was, if, if we had a problem, it wasn't, well, because you're adopted, it was because you're 12 or because you're 15. Uh, you know, and, and th th that's the womb to tomb life I'm trying to get at. And the other side of that is, is back to me walking with my friend. For a person who is pro-life to stand with a sign against a person who's making a difficult life decision at a clinic, but not support better education, better um, health care, better um, uh, housing options, better uh, economic uh, opportunities in a neighborhood. That's where it matters if this baby is born. Not that you necessarily take the adoption option to bring them into your home, to raise them as an other and get credit for yourself, but to make sure that that mother never needs to make the decision to say, I'm gonna have an abortion because I can't raise this child because I don't have a, a good job and I don't live in a decent neighborhood and there isn't a good store where I can get good food from. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little- I'm No, gonna... you, you, you know what, you, you remind me of the essay in the book, The Church and Abortion uh, written years ago, written by, and I can't think of her name, but she worked in a crisis pregnancy center. And I just remember her saying, that we need to understand that most women who have abortions, uh, they don't have it because that's their choice. They feel like they have no choice. No choice. Yeah, they feel like that's where they're stuck in. Now, now the response is going to be, and let me throw this to you, Michael, uh, is that they're going to say, you know what? Pro-life is to say, you know what? We do want that mom to have that care. We do want that mom to, you know, to be, but that's up to the private, the private individuals. That's, you know, the government has no place in that. Um, Michael, what do you say to that? 
Well, uh, I wrote <laughs> I wrote a a Facebook post or something. Uh, I don't know, maybe eight or ten months ago, after the big decision, that that said, what is? I was basically asking, what does the church need to do now? And one of the things I said in that post was, the church needs to support more opportunities for women and uh, children that are funded by the government as well as by the private sector, by churches and so forth. Boy, the, the backlash to that from self-identified pro-life people was, was quite negative because of the point you're just making, that this is up to individuals, this is up to churches or, or individual groups or you know whatever. There's a, a kind of fear, and I think it has to do with you know uh, bodies, uh, political bodies denouncing socialism. Uh, there's there's this fear that there's something unchristian and and un-American and unhuman about uh, governments actually doing something positive for the poor and oppressed. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's hard to read scripture and come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah, I, I've never understood this idea where biblically it's not their job. I, I remember Amos having some really harsh denunciations of the yeah. nations around Israel and Judah for their for exactly that, their their oppression and uh, marginalization and how they treated people. So I've never quite understood that. But the fear. Yeah, I mean, I've all, I've said for some time that the people who who complain the most about socialism are the people who understand it the least, <laughs> and and uh, caricature it. I'd like to come back to something we we haven't mentioned though that, and I I'm not sure this comes up on from either side, but the, the other thing that um, strikes me as significant here is how abortion has become almost a cultural necessity. And by that I mean, uh, in a in a culture where where rights and especially rights to sexual activity of any kind at any place at any stage um, have become the norm, that and and, and I don't know even I said, I don't even sure that pro life people quite understand this, but maybe they do and they're not articulating it. And in any event. Um, the point is this, I, I, I recently read an excerpt from a, a, a health curriculum for high school kids. And the excerpt said, sex has two purposes. One purpose is pleasure. The other purpose is procreation. That, that is, I think, the cultural mindset. And once that becomes the cultural mindset and it and becomes the cultural mindset of the church, as well, which I think it often is, um, abortion becomes a necessity because if if A becomes sex for pleasure becomes B un, unintended procreation. In order to return to A, you have to take care of B, and this has to become uh, part of the fabric, if you will, of the culture. So, in in I don't want to say in defense of pro life people, but in support of their their concern um and i and i i don't like labels but if i have to take a, a choice between pro life and pro choice i'll take the former and i i don't like labels but in in support of their concern for the value of human life from the moment of conception is on the other hand the anti value of our culture that sex is a casual event and if it happens to lead to unintended pregnancy there are a variety of options to take care of that and that is our given right that that to me ought to concern us no matter where we are on the on the theological and political spectrum yeah joy response yeah uh i appreciate that uh one of the things that comes to mind again, uh, when I was in college, uh, I, I have a I have a friend that um, we probably disagree on many social issues, um, not all, but on, on many social I issues politically, and um, um, she always always we, we've remained friends over these years, and 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 she always 
takes me back to when she realized that we could be friends even as we disagreed, particularly on the issue of abortion. I was writing a paper for uh, my sociology class on abortion. And um, uh, another friend was writing it. And my friend was writing it and she was pointing the finger against a person who would have an abortion. And my position was more saying, we need to have some questions, which leads to what you were saying, Michael, about how a person has the need. And once they find themselves in that situation, what is safely available to them? And my friend that I've stayed in relationship with said to me, she said, at that moment, she realized there's more to the way I was thinking. And she'd never heard anybody that disagreed with her on abortion who would nuance it in the way that I did. Yeah. Um, the, the other way that uh, we haven't talked about is, uh, and, 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 and I'm happy to revisit uh, this question of uh, just this pleasure point, because I think that's what, that's what gets us all, is whatever it is that seems pleasurable for us. And sometimes that pleasure is power. And the political power brokering that we started our conversation about is very pleasurable. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the other thing that we haven't talked about about that I think is real important when we talk about uh, the, the access to a legal and safe abortion are the people who need to have abortion for medical reasons. Mm -hmm. I heard right after the decision was made, I heard so many stories of women who were already scheduled to have a life-saving uh, termination of their pregnancy. People who themselves would identify as against abortion, but knew that they were risking their life yeah. for um, carrying um, what was not going to be a viable um, um, uh, human being uh, to, to a full term. And that is what was eliminated as well. So we're not only causing people in poverty to struggle um, with how to survive um, without proper medical care and without uh, living in an environment where they can sustain uh, themselves, let known a, a family, um, but we're also taking away those who have the resources, but their doctor has said to them, this is going to kill you and or um, you're not going to have a viable pregnancy. And mm -hmm. I can't take care of you medically because this new law, uh, this new decision is going to jeopardize my license. And that's a conversation that we, 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 haven't, we haven't put on the table either. Yeah, Joy, that, um, I, when you said that, I mean, immediately thought of a pastor friend of mine in North Carolina who is not pro-choice on abortion, but he said that because his wife works uh, in a neonatal, you know, with, with mothers and said that the, the laws, the way the laws have worked now in North Carolina, that it's hard for women who really need to have these procedures, not because they just want to have an abortion, but because they've got pregnancies that aren't viable there, it's, you know, and it's hard for them to happen. You know, what, what is, you know, there was time back in the eighties, I can remember people who were pro-life, they were pro-life, but I don't remember the kind of, I'm going to call it extreme fetishism for, for the notion of, of, a, of, of a, a fetus in a way, and my language here is not is not helping either, but in a way that you can't even make decisions that I mean, I had someone say to me uh, in reference to ectopic pregnancies, which, you know, are not viable and it will not, you know, the, the response was, well, I think at that point you just need to pray. I mean, it's like what in the you know where you know what what happened to. Um, Oh, anyway, it, it, it's, it's almost maddening that we have become almost so extreme on certain and in the way we characterize certain things that uh, maybe uh, other things are just getting neglected that shouldn't be. 
Yeah, one thing I would would say just to clarify my earlier comments, I I don't at all mean to say uh, that the main the only reason people uh, are seeking um, terminate a pregnancy is because of a casual attitude towards sex. That's not always the case. I I, I want to clarify. I do think that that's often the case, and I do think that that's something that needs to be addressed, especially within the church. Our understanding of uh, human sexuality, and that's that's opening a can of worms just mentioning that topic. But but uh, Joy's you know, poignant comments about uh, social conditions and all of those things need to be taken into account, and, and medical realities. Uh, I'm not a physician. I've never claimed to have medical knowledge and training. I do know that even among Christian physicians, there's differing points of view on how often and in what circumstances such procedures are necessary. But that's this is why laws don't com even less than completely satisfy from a Christian right. point of view. I've I've never been one to say that the way the main way to address this issue in, in society from a Christian point of view is the legal way. Yeah. So Michael, let me then ask you, go ahead, Joy. Go ahead. If, if I, if I, if thank you for letting me come behind that. Um, and it's unfortunate, Michael, that you're right. You did have to clarify that. That's not what I heard, uh, but you're, and I'm thinking of some of the things that I said that I'm like, Oh, wow. I hope people are still listening. Maybe I can re-nuance that to, to, to basically say, I'm trying to problematize this conversation um, more than simply throw answers out. But here is an answer that I think you're getting at, Michael. And that is, as a Christian, there are certain um, uh, perspectives and practices that we should engage in that will be peculiar in the culture. And they're not easily identified by a political stance absolutely on the left or the right. I want to also say as a Christian, I need to allow for the person who does not share my faith to be able to make a decision that is not based on my worldview. And in that sense, that's why I went with my friend Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and it's not that she wasn't a Christian, but she was thinking she was mourning and she was fearful of how her small white community would respond to her as an unwed mother with a black child. Yeah. And my Christian response to her at that time was she's, she's nuancing a bigger situation that I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. And, and as a Christian, I need to take into consideration what are people who do not share my faith needing in my demonstration of God's love that will make them say, you know, I had an abortion and now I understand why that isn't what I want to do again. Yeah. But what we do is we make a decision on a person where they just, they walk over in a line and we, feel, we say, once you cross that line, there's no redemption. There's no transformation. And where is God yeah, if there is no transformation or redemption. And and where are the Christian virtue, virtues of mercy and compassion? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting as you all say this is that um, the the uh, theological uh, doctrine here is incarnation, and we as the church aren't really good at being incarnational. Which <laughs> uh, coming into the mess, right? For me, that's incarnation. Jesus comes in. God comes into the mess mm -hmm. of the human situation, and we we want to do clean hands, kind of ministry so let me let me do this um because I, I do want to ask briefly before we close out just some thoughts about uh our perspective as far as where the church goes from here on certain things but so if if we determine say that the right to life right to choose in a christian context is not the best way to have the discussion what are some of the important considerations theological considerations that we need to think about if we are to have a better conversation, at least within the Christian community on this issue. I don't remember who I went to last, but let me, let me jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Partly because I'm, I'm eager to hear how Michael responds. 
but I, I want to I want to say this that I hope kind of um, kind of pulls together some of the strands I've thrown around uh, in our conversation. Rather than making a political statement on the left or the right, signing a petition, marching on the Capitol steps. Um, if what we do is we try to find out how I can walk beside an individual, an individual that I would welcome into my church, uh, an individual that I would um, enter into their community, which might be on the other side of the tracks to use that old language, mm. um, and walk with them through the difficult decision, um, even if it's one I disagree with, but rather than take an anonymous person and say, you need to live by my rules, but to find ourselves incarnationally in relationship with that person. That, that for me seems to be the biblical way of doing things. The God who walks among us, who sought Adam and Eve um, in, in the garden when, when they turned from God, who never um, abandoned Israel when, ab when Israel abandoned God, the God who took on human flesh, and as you just described, Alan, um, took on the messiness of our life. Um, for us to be Christ-like would be for us to do that. And it might mean we don't get to sign a petition or get our face on, on you know, the local television, but we might make a difference in an individual life that could have an impact for generations. That I think is a, a Christian response that we too little uh, explore. Okay. Michael? Well, I'd certainly uh, affirm everything that Joy said in terms of walking with, with individuals and uh, not going out signing petitions and, and making our, our appearance on, on a camera. But I guess I, I want to think also more broadly ecclesial, ecclesially about this. And that is to say, uh, and I think Joy actually was saying something about this earlier in our conversation. What does it mean to be the peculiar people of God? You know, there's a there's an early Christian document that says, uh, you know, we're like everybody else. We 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 speak the local language. We do this and we do that. But there's certain things we don't do. And as a community, we we raise our children. We don't leave them in the dump heap because they happen to be deformed we don't uh we don't we don't we, we share everything among ourselves except we don't share beds i mean it's there, there's there's a sense in which the church is supposed to be a distinctive culture and a culture which welcomes walks with does does life together and I, I just don't see that as the norm of the church in North America right now. I, and that troubles me greatly. Um, and I, I think part of my mission in, in teaching and writing is to call the church to be to be the church. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and I agree with you. And that probably uh, is, is, a, is a big uh, uh, indicator of why, as I said, I think moral discourse in the church is in an abysmal state because we, we have not, uh, when we define being radical, actually, actually, when we define being Christian, it actually, Stanley, again, to quote Stanley Arwas, who I keep bringing this position, says the problem with Christians in America is that we're more American than Christian. Exactly. And and that that's the dilemma. So we just kind of parrot everything that's out in the culture. Michael, you said something when you posted, and I remember that social media post you made after Roe was overturned. But you said something about seeing the unborn child as the neighbor, mm. which which really struck me because I thought, now that's biblical, right? I mean, I mean Jesus, the the Bible has a lot to say about neighbor and how you treat neighbor. What? What does it look like for you to see the, the the not only the woman in the difficult pregnancy as our neighbor because she is, but but to see the child that she carries also as our neighbor? How does that all of a sudden change this conversation a little bit? Well, uh, to go back to the political view, oftentimes 
it's one or the other, right? Either that that's the that's the divide, I think, in, yeah. in Christian thinking and in and maybe in secular language and political you thinking. Mean, well. You mean mother versus child? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but I, you know, I I didn't invent the idea of uh, looking at the as the as a developing human as our neighbor that comes right right out of the Jewish tradition and and particularly embodied in the early Christian writings, where in the in, in the Didache late first century, uh, here's what it means to love your neighbor and two of the two of the prohibitions under love your neighbor are don't don't have an abortion and don't don't kill the newborn child i mean it's pretty simple <clears throat> you you you're not loving a neighbor when you're doing those two things from the early christian point of view and i would say that's straight out of the jewish the jewish point of view yeah. so it 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 means taking care of both and that may be costly for the church it may be costly for the society pardon me hmm. tickle you mentioned earlier is coming back. Yeah. Okay. Joy, a uh, qu question for you. I'm, one of the things I've said to my more progressive friends on this issue is why isn't abortion the social justice issue? I mean, you, you talk about poverty and you talk about all those other social justice issues, which are, but why don't we see, why is abortion always excluded as an issue of social justice? Because the way that we talk about social justice these days is a, is a, is along a partisan line. And yeah. so we have a, a modern idea that um, some scholars uh, have, have described as social justice with a capital S, capital J. And uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's the politically correct way of talking about is issues okay. uh, that, are, that are pretty partisan. Uh, and I, I like to think of social justice in the biblical sense, uh, uh, the way that my, Michael was referencing er earlier. Um, and if I can, to piggyback on, on the comments that Michael was making, it makes me say that the, the best way for this to be a social justice issue is for abortion not to be uh, illegal, but for it to be unnecessary. And for it to be unnecessary would mean that we would recognize the racism that is implicit in the way abortions affect the minority community of African-Americans. Uh, the African-American uh, community is not the largest minority community. Hispanics are now the largest minority community if, if we use those racial uh, ethnic categories. Um, and yet um, uh, over a third of abortions uh, uh, diminish the uh, community of African-Americans. And, and for us to take that on, which again, as I said earlier, is part of the reason that this was brought, uh, brought forward um, uh, originally was to, to, to reduce the African-American population. Um, it, that's a kind of social justice issue that if we want to have a racialized conversation that, that I would like to see us address. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that social justice, capital S, capital J, is not interested in biblical social justice. Right. Uh, it is interested in a partisan political fundamentalism. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, the church, you know, again, I, I think that the church needs to be the alternative to the world. And, you know, uh, uh, but right now, I mean, you know, I would like to be able to say and get consensus from whether it's the United Methodist Church or any other church. I'd like to be able to say um, if we're going to speak to if we're going to speak to uh, this, uh, our culture on abortion, uh, Christians need to not only not be people who have abortions, uh, but also people who are willing to sacrifice in order to take care of uh, the least of these, which includes women in difficult pregnancies and uh, children, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Th throughout scripture, there's this concern for women, often widows, yeah, and orphans, always children. Well, another conversation is, is here on materialism and possession sets, because <laughs> that's part and parcel of, of, the, of the conversation I, I feel. But I just, I, I think we need to be that alternative, but I, I, I can't say I'm really, I mean. The, the practices of the church 
where um, we, if we simply said that we were going to not participate, uh, I, I, you know, I've not been saying this the whole time, and I'm just going to say this. Um, yeah. um, I, I've, I've, as a United Methodist, have been involved in the confessing movement, mm-hmm. uh, and. Um, what many people don't know about the confessing movement is when it was established, um, it was around five issues. Everyone knows that it, the conversation included homosexuality. Um, what folks don't know is the conversation also included abortion, divorce, and serial remarriage, uh, uh, serial polygamy, I think is the way it was, it was phrased. Um, uh, dealing with racial uh, inequality and uh, dealing with poverty. Uh, so those were the five tenets of the confessing movement as it, as it was established. And um, one of the interesting things for me, uh, very early on, I want to say maybe in 96, I was sitting in a room. Uh, it was whenever uh, the, the meeting was in Ohio. I was sitting in a room and um, my friend Paul Stallsworth, who's part of Life Watch, um, uh, the uh, uh, pro-life uh, United Methodist Caucus, and uh, he was asked to give a presentation uh, from uh, a pro-life p- a Methodist position. And in that room, of all people who were part of the confessing movement, I watched um, um, these leaders say, we cannot talk about abortion because too many of us have either um, been the reason that our wives or girlfriends have needed an abortion or have affirmed our daughters or women in our lives having an abortion. Mm -hmm. And that very thought that we could not talk about abortion because we were practicing abortion is in your face against the challenge you just laid to us, Alan. Wow. Yeah, the Quakers, uh, the Quakers before the Civil War said we can't we can't honestly uh, speak with integrity to the government to tell them slavery should be illegal when Quakers own slaves. So they said Quaker, Quakers, Quakers can't have slaves, which you know increased the membership of the uh, the Anglican Church, Episcopalian Church, because okay. Quakers weren't about to give up their slaves. Um, boy, that that's quite the uh, ending point. Well, we are at at about time. Um, boy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation. You, this has been so illuminating. And one thing I hope that it does is it just helps us all to see that these are the kinds of necessary conversations we need to have. And and more robust conversations and not just parroting back. Uh, yeah. so if you really want to get, if you really want to get a good take on an important issue, regardless of what it is, you can't listen to most politicians and you can't watch the evening cable news pundits, because huh. if you want to make sure you don't know what's going on, just, just listen to them. Uh, any last minute thoughts from either of you, Michael? Just a statement of appreciation for your willing to, willingness to uh, host this conversation and uh, Joy's willingness to participate with uh, with me. And so, thank you. That's uh, yeah. Thanks to, to be interesting to hear what the audience uh, reaction is to what we've had to say. It will be interesting. Yes, it will. Joy, I'll let you end the conversation. Well, I too am grateful uh, for being able to be a part of this conversation. And I think the other challenge I'd like to put before uh, your listeners is um, we've tried to nuance the conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we're listening to find affirmation of our position, whatever that position is, we're really not seeking understanding. And so I would challenge uh, uh, the listeners to this podcast in particular. uh, and, And I'll just say for myself, if a slip of my tongue overstated something where you lost the nuance and you just said, I'm going to write her off there. Forgive me because I'm more interested in people realizing that uh, to use Michael's words, to be Christian in you as well, Alan, to be Christian is to be peculiar. And that means peculiar in our practices so that the world recognizes the way it's doing things isn't right. Yeah. To be peculiar in our practices and in our speech. And um, boy, 
a good way to end this conversation. Thank you both. And um, friends, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. This is uh, Courageous Conversations, Faith Seeking Understanding University. I am Alan Bevere. And the patron saint of Faith Seeking Understanding University is Anselm of Canterbury, who said, I do not understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. Friends, keep seeking. <laughs>